And this one is simply entitled, We Really Do Need Each Other. You notice that's kind of the title of our 40 days of community over the last weeks and the Bible studies in which we've been participating in. Well, this one kind of wraps up a lot of the themes today and is uh, that we've been dealing with. And it's really a powerful story that I would like to read to you that occurred shortly before Jesus' death. This is found in the book of John, chapter 12. And so here are these words. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And here a dinner was given, and Jesus honored <clears throat> honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was then filled with the fragrance of perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's worth of wages. He did not say this because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor amongst you, but you will not always have me. Here ends the lesson. Thanks be to God. So this story seems pretty straightforward. Jesus' feet were anointed with, with a perfume and so forth. But you notice our beginning is that usually people, when they were anointed, were anointed with oil, and the oil was poured over their head. And after all, that's what it means to be the Messiah. The word Messiah means the anointed one. And one of the things you may not be aware of, there were many anointed ones or many messiahs in the history of Israel. In fact, let me name you a couple. Saul, the very first king of Israel, was the Messiah. David, the king, was called the Messiah. Solomon, his son, was called the Messiah. They were anointed by a prophet, anointed with oil. It was a sign that they were set apart for God's purpose. <coughs> now, I know you usually think of the Messiah only being Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate Messiah. He is the last of the Messiahs, and he is the only true Messiah who brings reconciliation between God and humanity. But these other Messiahs, make no mistake, were dedicated for a purpose by God and were anointed with oil as a sign of God's choosing of them. Now, in our lesson for today, Mary decides to do something a little bit different. Now, let's clarify who this Mary is. When you think of this story of the anointing with oil and the wiping of the hair and the feet of Jesus and so forth, usually the person that comes to mind is who? Mary Magdalene. But that's not who this is about. She is not the person doing the anointing here. Who is the person that does the anointing? Mary, the mother, or Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, is the person that does this. Okay? We've got our facts all confused here. So this is Mary, the sister of Lazarus. Now, why would she be doing this? You have to understand her motivation. Something just happened just before the lesson for today. Her brother Lazarus was dead. He died. And Jesus came and resuscitated, resurrected him from that death. And Mary and Martha were so grateful for the gift that Jesus gave to them. Mary in particular, that she wanted to do something spectacular and extravagant and thanks for this. You have to understand, this is no small matter. Lazarus, it seems, was a very well-to-do and wealthy person. These were, this was a wealthy family. But these seemed like they were two uh, either widowed uh, women or women who have never been married or would never be married. They had nothing without their brother. They were in deep trouble if their brother was dead. And so they were very grateful for the fact that Lazarus had been delivered, re-delivered to them again so they could have him. And so, again, what does Mary do? She comes up and anoints his feet, not with oil in this case, but with perfume. And, uh, and, and, and it was common, just a little bit of common courtesy here. Remember, there are, Jesus has come to Lazarus' household. And normally when a person comes into your household, one of the things that you do is you put out a bowl of water. Don't you? This is what you do at your house. You put out a bowl of water and some soap so they can wash their feet, right? Okay, if you're a Jew, trust me, that's what you would do. Remember, they're walking with sandals out in the desert in a dirty place where cows and sheep and other animals Animal. have 
trod, and there's a lot of manure, and trust me, it stinks. And so you don't want to be sitting beside the guy with his sticky feet. And so you grab the water, you clean your feet. Mary, in this case, anoints his feet with perfume and wipes them with her hair. It was not common for that to take place. And this so gets Judas upset that he starts shaking his fist and saying, this is a great waste. Even a good Jew would see it was a great waste. And see, I, I love this lesson because this is interesting. It kind of shows the bias and the bigotries of the disciples. What did John say? Well, you know, Judas was a thief anyway. I bet you every single one of the apostles was thinking the exact same thing. Judas was the only one with courage to say, this is such a waste of money. Every one of the apostles hey, didn't think this was a great idea. But they were hiding behind Judas. So Judas was the bad guy here. And then, of course, like I said, you notice the phrase that they add. Oh, well, he was a thief stealing from the uh, offering uh, the, of the disciples. I, honestly, I think that's bogus. I don't think it's true. It's my opinion. I think they had such resentment, such a chip on their shoulders, such hatred towards Judas, that they just kind of re went, went back in history and relabeled him as just a thief and so forth. But nevertheless, whether he was or wasn't, the point is Judas actually represents what everybody was thinking. This is a waste of money. You could have spent this money on something better. Now, what was so odd again about this anointing? Look at this box here, or this paragraph. Again, it was Jesus understood it as an anointing. That he was not simply having his feet washed, but he was being set apart and set aside for something. What was also odd about this is it was done by a, oh, I don't want to get you upset. Are you ready? A woman. No other Messiah in the history of Messiahs in the Old Testament had ever been anointed by a woman. But Jesus was anointed by a woman and set aside for God's purposes. I believe that this is a very significant act because I've always believed that Jesus is very progressive in his views of women compared to a lot of people in that day and age. He believed that women were equal to men. So much so that he believed a woman was going to do the one to set him aside to be anointed for his purpose and his job that was coming up. Oops, here I am. Excuse me. I'm here. Um, that Jesus was going to be set aside and anointed by a woman is a spectacular thing. And once again, it takes woman who was down here, at least in the view of the culture, and puts her equal to the man. That's really significant and important. So anybody who tells you the Bible is filled with a bunch of bigoted stories about uh, against women. Yeah, there's some stories that are bigoted against women, but the Bible, for the most part, really tries to understand and give us the understanding that woman is equal to male. It's important. I lift, I'm trying to lift you women up, because you are precious. Without women, there wouldn't be any kids. Trust me. Am I right, Jake? Yeah. yeah. This baby here would not have been born. It would have been up to, up to Jake. So, anyways, so it was done by a woman. This anointing was a sign of Jesus' coming death. This is something unique as well. Remember how I said that all of us, and this was related to last week's lesson, if you were part of the Bible studies, I told you that I believe that Jesus does not call us to die for each other. Jesus calls us to live for each other. And so this idea that laying down our lives means that we have to die for each other. No, I think that's stupid. You can't help somebody. You can't be there for them if you're dead. But in Jesus' case, Jesus is the only death that means something for the salvation of the world. And so in this case, unlike every other, uh, every other uh, Messiah before him who was appointed and anointed to live, Jesus was appointed and anointed to die so that the world might be reconciled to him. We're going to get more into that as we get to Easter. And so he knew his death was imminent. And so what Mary did... Out of gratitude for what Jesus had done, she expressed it in a manner to, uh, that expressed her understanding and appreciation for the great sacrifice of Christ. Not even the other 12 disciples understood this. And her gift is so extravagant and obscene and absurd and ridiculous because she was so grateful for everything that Jesus had done for her. Now, this is what I think this means to us and what we learn. And I hope this is a part of the lesson that you will take to heart. I believe that what this lesson means to you and me is that we should care extravagantly and ridiculously 
for all those whom we love, whom God has placed in our path and in our life. Because we are not any of us promised a tomorrow, and so we should shower upon each other extravagant, extravagant riches that express how much we love each other. So I'm saying that to spouses. I'm saying that to mothers and fathers for their kids. I'm saying that to those of us who have friends, we should be extravagant in the way we demonstrate our love for them because we are not promised that we will have them tomorrow. Life can come to a shocking and sudden end, and once it comes to an end in this life, that's it. And so Mary understood that and, was ex and understood the fragile nature of life. It's that, that's that, uh, that's that Italian word, fragile. One or two of you got it. It's from the Christmas story. Go watch the movie. So the fragile nature of love, she understood, and that was the reason why she was so extravagant with her love for Jesus. This life, as I mentioned, can come to a sudden shocking end without warning. Therefore, always be reconciled in relationships. Always be extravagant in your love for one another because this might be the only moment you get. I'm going to share a story and also an example here. First of all, the exa the, this example of what Jews do whenever they greet each other, they say hello, they say goodbye. What's the word that they use? Shalom. Shalom. You guys know that. We often translate that word as hello and goodbye, but that would be an inaccurate translation of it. The word shalom actually means peace. In sync. Everything's in order. Why would I say that to somebody when I come to them? When I come up to you and I greet you, I say shalom. What that means is I'm at peace with you. We are in sync. We don't have to try to go through a whole list of explanations or a whole list of things that, uh, that we have to recount to go through to reconcile a relationship. I'm already at peace with you. We can just pick up a relationship where we last left it off. And then when I leave you and I say shalom, those words are so powerful because what I'm saying to people when I'm leaving you, shalom, I'm saying to you, we're at peace. We're at one. If something happens to me, I get hit by a bus when I leave this place, you don't have any reason for feeling guilty because we were one. Now let me use a good illustration of this. This is a story that just happened a couple weeks ago. I just did a funeral for a 49-year-old man. He went away for a week's worth of vacation, and he was supposed to report back on a Monday. He didn't report back to work on that Monday, didn't report back to work on that Tuesday. His workplace was really concerned about him, and so they called the police. The police broke in. He had been dead playing a video game for days, okay, just sitting there, that's really sad, and so the thing is, he was well loved, and as I went to the funeral, I was talking to a lot of the people, there was a great deal of angst and guilt and remorse, and everybody's like, we didn't know, and I can't believe he was sitting there for a week, and we didn't know, and we should have been there, we should have checked in on him sooner, and oh, I should have said this before he died, I should have done that before he died, and I mean, this is the type of grief, especially when a younger person dies, that people feel, they're just feeling so, so, so angst-filled, and so grief-stricken, oh, I should have said more, I should have contacted him sooner, I should have done this, I should have done that, and I said to them, look, all of you are feeling this type of angst, but let me ask you a question. How many of you, in your last opportunity that you saw him, left feeling upset with him? And nobody did. I said, so all of you are in good relationship, on good terms with him, and you left. They said, yes. And I said, well, good, because that means all that angst, all that guilt, all that heartache, all that pain is just wasted energy, because you were in shalom with him. He knew that you were in shalom with him. He died in peace with you. You should know that... He was at peace with you, and you should be at peace with him. It's all good. Guilt is such a wasted emotion, people. You need to get rid of that guilt in your life. There's absolutely no reason. If you're at peace with somebody and they leave, and they die, you are at peace with them. It's okay. I actually had somebody this morning after the service come into me in tears and said, Wow, I really appreciated that. Because her, her mom just died. She said, my mom died. And I was feeling guilty about not feeling guilty. 
And, and then she said, then I realized why I don't feel guilty, because I saw my mom every day. I said everything that needed to be said. Everything was good with us. I said, there you go. She said, so I don't feel guilty about feeling guilty anymore. I guess I'm set free. I said, there you go. God is good. You know, here's the thing. This lesson today is all about reconciliation. It's about relationships. It's about gratitude. Because there are so many things that are important in life, and all of them are seated around you right now. I see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 people already. We have a church on Sunday. Everybody's watching. Those are all the people that are of value and they're important in life. Your friends, your family. How many people is that? 100 people? I don't know. How many people are your acquaintances with? They're all precious. That's what life is ultimately about. It's about reconciliation. It's about relationships. It's about gratitude. Because this I can tell you, at the end of your life, there's not a one of you are going to say, Dang, never. I should have spent 10 more hours at work. Okay? <laughs> no. You, sh you should have driven one more bus trip there, John. No, you're not going to say that. What are you going to say? Oh, I should have sat there and watched another sunset with my spouse. I should have listened to a little bit more Chopin. I should have sat there and been with my friends a little more often. Those are the things that we regret. Those are the things that are truly important. Maybe what we need to do and as we look at this lesson for today is ultimately realize this is what's important in life. So, we really do need each other, right? We're created to go through this life together. Life Faith, it's ultimately about the people who surrounded us. Our congregation ultimately should be known for the people. So we look around here. We've got a small group of people gathered here today. But every single one of them is precious. Every single one of them. I want you to just take a moment and look at the people. Maybe you, maybe you don't know some, some of the folks that are here. Make sure you get to know them before you leave because they're all precious. Okay? Every single one of you are precious in God's sight. Every one of you should be precious to us. Because our church should not be known for our building. It shouldn't be known for our programs. It shouldn't be even known for kids' programs. We should be known for the love that we have for each other. Because that's what a church ultimately is all about. I want to tell you another quick story. And we'll finish here. When I came here a long time ago, I don't even remember, this. I, you don't ask me who the people were, because I know you're here and you know some of the old timers and so forth. I don't remember, I'm just outright telling you, I don't remember who this was. But there was a man who died in our congregation. He had been a lifelong member. And when I announced in the congregation that Joe Smith, which obviously wouldn't have been a Joe Smith, I'm just making that up because I don't know who it was, and I'm not sure I'd say it if I did. Say, so Joe Smith died. And everybody looked at me like, who? Joe Smith died, and we're doing the funeral such and such. Who's Joe Smith? I mean, nobody knew who the guy was. And finally, I looked at some people. He sat right here every single Sunday. Oh, Jimmy. Well, I don't know, because you know they're Slovaks. They have, they have your real name, and then they have your nickname. We knew him as Jimmy. We didn't know his last name was Smith. Then nobody knew who he was. Outside, he was Jimmy, sat in the pew right up there every Sunday. It's like, what the heck? What type of church are we that people come into church and we don't know who they are? Everybody should be connected to somebody else in a congregation. Because ultimately, a congregation isn't about its programs, its building, about the things that take place here. It's all about the people that gather together. Because we need each other. We really do need each other. Because I'm telling you, God will often give you things in life that you just cannot handle by yourselves. If you're a parent, you got parents here, you know that you can't handle everything in your life without some help. You need other people. When he went to Iraq, you needed help. Okay? When uh, people are gone, for, uh, when people are sick, when my wife was sick, we needed help. We had help. And I'm so grateful for everybody who intervened on our behalf. There are times that we just have more than we can handle by ourselves. And so we build relationships so that we can help people in their times of need. And so they can help us in our times of need. It is not a weakness to depend upon the help of others because that's how God has created us. Even Jesus depended upon the extravagant love 
of his friends. So take a look at the bottom, the very last thing. That's why when we worship, we are called to do it together. Remember I told you last week I had a woman who wanted to know whether we're streaming our service. Maybe she's watching. She's going to get really ticked off at me. I don't know. But there's, I, I've had this happen many times. So it's not just one person. You say, well, I just want to know if I can not have to go to the service. I'd rather stream the service because, you know, oftentimes people don't like being around people. And I kind of get it. But we're created to be amongst people. Worship is all about gathering together as the people of God. Uh, so well, that's why we worship. We worship together. We've got to be surrounded by other people. That's why when we commune, we need to commune with other people. I've seen this stupid thing. It's called an individual communion kit that you're supposed to be able to open up and take communion with Jesus on your own at home. That's the dumbest thing in the world. It's stupid. Why is it stupid? Because there's no such thing as private communion. I have somebody say, well, I'm communing with Jesus. That's not the point. The point is it's called two or more in God's name gathered together, then Jesus is in the midst of us. You only have you. If you don't have one other person, it ain't communion. There's no such thing as private communion. So why? that's why when we commune, it's, it's like a contradiction of word. I don't know. I mean, it's just, how can you commune if you don't have at least one other person? So that's why when we commune, we commune, we do it together. That's why when we sing, sing terrible songs, I don't know if you liked all the songs today, maybe some were crummy. I mean, yeah, some, some yeah. Okay. Like some were crummy, some I like, some you like, some, you know, the great thing about singing hymns is that there's always somebody who likes a hymn or a song that we're singing, there's always somebody who can't stand it. But you know what? We do it together. I tell our traditional folks, you know the two hymns I cannot stand? You guys who know me long, long enough know the two hymns. I cannot absolutely stand these songs. If I hear them, it's like taking your fingers on a chalkboard. What are they? Amazing grace, how great they are. I swear to God, if I have to sing them again, I'm going to pull my ears off. I cannot stand those songs. And you want to know why I can't stand them? Because I sing them at every stick and funeral. All over the place. I've probably sung those hundreds and hundreds of thousands of times. I don't know, hundreds of thousands of times. That's a little bit of a hyperbole. But the point is, I get tired of the song. What are you looking at me that way for? I want to sing at my funeral. You want to sing at your funeral? I'm going to love it there. You want to know why? Because it's important to you. This is my point. Is that I can't stand these songs, but because you love it, it's important to me. That's the point of what I'm trying to make. And so every song we do, you may not like all the songs, but somebody does, and so we sing them together because they're important to somebody. Ah, that was really good. That kind of, you, you look like you set that up with me. It was like, perfect. <laughs> awesome. So we sing terrible songs that no one likes, we do it together. We sing songs that only half the people like, we do it together, and that's what makes it cool. That's why when we need encouragement, we don't shout meaningless words from afar. We walk together. And so this is a story I'm going to end on. For those who are doing the Bible studies, I hope you are. If you haven't started, it's not too late. There's DVDs with weekly Bible studies over there. I tell the story, I actually read the story from Reuben Welsh that he tells at the end of his book, We Really Do Need Each Other, about a class at the college campus, it was, he was a pastor, or a pastor and a, a uh, scholar at a Christian college back in the 60s and 70s. And Reuben writes about a college course that had just wrapped up, and it was a group of kids that wanted to do something to celebrate the ending of the class, and they wanted to do something together. And so they decided to take a hike up a hill that was behind the school. The hill was a typical California hill. If you've seen them, like MASH, if you've ever watched the, the show MASH, those are the typical California hills. That's, that's what they are. And they've got a lot of switchbacks going up. He said the hill itself takes maybe about an hour for the average person to walk up. So they were going to do a picnic. And they made sandwiches and brought cookies and brought drinks and, and their backpacks. And they started up the hill. And he had the really athletic guys who were just running up the hill and just having a good time. And they were far ahead of everybody else. And then you had kind of the middle group that was kind of sitting there and taking a little more time. You know, the, they were going to take about an hour to get up there, but they'd make it. But then he said, you had one girl who was so out of shape, and she was way behind everybody else. 
Now there's switchbacks, so they could see her way down there, and they, and he said, so everybody started shouting her, hey, come on up here, it's great up here, come on up here. And she said, I can't make it. Everybody said, sure you can, they yelled down. And she got so discouraged and so frustrated. Have you ever know what it's like? We were so far behind everybody, and everybody's way, all, way in front of you and shouting for you to come along, oh, you can make it. She got so discouraged, she never did make it up to the top of the hill that day. It was a very discouraging end of the class. So they got back together, they talked about it, they said, we don't want our class to end this way. We want to end on a better note than this. And so what they decided to do is they invited everybody to participate again, but this time they changed the rules. We have to stay together. We are going to go the pace of the slowest person. And we're going to enjoy our time together because that's the purpose of this. So they made the sandwiches and the cookies and brought the drinks and put them in the backpacks and they started this trip up there. Remember, it's a trip that normally takes an hour. It took them four hours for every single one of them to crest the top of the hill. By then, the drinks were gone. All the food was gone because they were all hungry after all. And the trip up, it was taking a long time. But they all made it together. See, that's the purpose of church. The purpose of church is for us to go on this journey together. That's why I'm here. You know, we're supposed to have a congregation meeting today. You want to know how much money I make? It's in that It's in that folder over there. Go ahead and take a look at it. It's less than half of what I'd make in another church. So why am I here? Am I stupid? No, I'm not stupid. I love you guys. That's why I'm here. I'm not here because of the pay. I'm not here because you've got a great, beautiful building. You know, we've got kind of our frumpy sometimes in our building. Sometimes our programs don't exactly go exactly perfectly. We don't have the best programs in the world. But I'm here because of all of you guys. Okay? That's why I'm here. Because I'm on a journey. And I'm on a journey I want to do together with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you call us to do this journey together. Even Jesus himself in our lesson for today desperately needed Mary to acknowledge the sacrifice that he was about to make. And so too do we need the help and the intervention of other people in our lives. So we look around. This is the group of people that you've given us, God. We are called to love each other and care for each other. So I'm telling you, we need to be invested in each other's lives. Because that's the only way we're going to make it through this life, is if we do it together. We just are so grateful for the blessings of each other. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.